meeting you right where you are on your foster care journey. This is The Forgotten Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Forgotten Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Cabe, and I am so happy to be with you. If you are part of the foster care community, passionate about serving, or simply interested in learning more, we are here for you. In every episode of this podcast, you will hear stories from men and women who have experienced foster care to one degree or another. They may have grown up in the system, are caseworkers, foster parents, or others who are here to bring you hope or encouragement. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and share it with a friend. And remember, you are not alone. I hope you enjoy The Forgotten Podcast. Well, today on the podcast, I have with me Anna Bernacki, and I'm so excited to have her on the show, and you'll get to meet her in just a second. She grew up in, actually, she she grew up um, in an adoptive home. She was in foster care, placed in foster care as an infant, but really only experienced foster care a very short time. Grew up with a younger brother and sister who were also adopted by different biological families. Since then, Anna is now married to her husband, Brian, for almost a decade. That's big news. (laughs) And (laughs) you were foster parents for six years. Now you're adoptive parents to two different sibling sets of two. So I I am terrible at math, but what I'm thinking that means is four children. Correct. Do I have yes. that right? <laughs> okay. Yes, that is correct. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show. Super happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I would love to hear more about your story because um, although you spent a short amount of time in foster care, in fact, you don't even remember your time in foster care, you still right. had a very deep desire to know your parents. And, and that kind of plays out a lot through your story. And so... Wherever you really, wherever you want to start, um, I'll give you a, a thought here, but you can take it somewhere else if you'd like. But I am curious when you first kind of began to understand that you were adapted into this family and that you had spent some time in foster care. I think early on, I'm very thankful my parents introduced that to us, the concept of being adopted when we were very young. Mm -hmm. So there never was a moment where they sat us down and said, oh, by the way, you're adopted. Um, So I'm very thankful that I was just ingrained into our childhood. You know, we were, we talked about our birth parents and where we came from. So honestly, it was almost a weird concept to me to understand that my friends didn't have birth parents and weren't adopted because it was so natural and so normal to me. So I'm actually very thankful for that. It wasn't a shock. It wasn't, um, you know, this big sit down talk. It was just a very natural concept in our family. So I am thankful for that. It was just something that naturally, as we grew up, we asked more questions Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, age appropriate answers to those questions. So I think the foster care part came more later. And And I think we did know our well, we actually met our foster parents and we maintained mm. a relationship with our foster parents because my brother and I actually have the same foster parents, oh, which is very strange. Yeah. Um, but somehow we ended up in the same foster family. So we remained in touch with them throughout our childhood. So, I mean, not like super close, but we would see yep. them every couple of years, mm-hmm. just kind of Christmas cards. So we knew who they were, but I didn't really fully understand the concept of foster mm-hmm. care, I don't think. Um, it was just more like they took care of us until we were able to be adopted. Sure. And that, I mean, that was back in the 80s. So things were very different then. Yeah, right. There wasn't the concept. I mean, now, thankfully, yeah. they understand that infant adoption, they need to be placed in their adoptive homes right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so there isn't that time in between in foster care. And I'm very, very thankful for that that, that has been realized now. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I really truly understood what foster care was really until in a I was an adult. Mm, Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when do you remember as you were, you were open with your parents, your parents were open with you. When do you remember starting to have this desire? Again, maybe you always had it, but this desire to know your birth family or your birth parents. I think it was kind of always, you know, in childhood, 
it would be, you know, the someday, maybe I'll meet her. And then it was in my teen years more so. I think that, you know, every teenager has that desire, mom and dad are so mean, (laughs) you know? And I think when you're adopted, then it's, well, I'm not like them. They don't Mm. understand me. So obviously it's because I'm adopted. And so then you start shifting that blame to it's because I'm adopted that they don't understand me. It's because, and so that blame rather than I'm just a normal teenager going Mm -hmm. through normal teenage things, that blame got shifted to it's because I'm adopted. Mm -hmm. So it became my like sole desire that all my problems would be solved Mm -hmm. if I would find my biological mother because then she would understand me and I could live happily ever after. And we would just share this bond and this connection that would be unexplainable by anything else, Mm. but our DNA. And it would just be perfect because I saw my friends and, you know, they had such a perfect relationship with their parents. Right. (laughs) You know, what I was seeing was not reality. I was seeing the out in public version and they were probably saying the same thing about me and my parents. Right. 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 And it was a very filtered version. So it was not the reality, but in my mind, Mm -hmm. I had created this and it was just this mystery that I had to have solved. I had to solve this mystery Mm. and it really turned into quite an obsession. Looking Mm. back, it really was quite an obsession. And thank goodness the internet wasn't what it was was, today. I was thinking about that. (laughs) Yeah, because it really probably would have become a problem. Mm. So thank goodness it wasn't. And there wasn't ways to search like Mm. there was today. Um, Because I think that really was a protection for me Mm. because I was not able to search and find. Yeah, And that was definitely a protection for me is that I was just left with my own imagination, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a couple of questions that this is making me think. One, you mentioned your birth mom. So was it was, was it primarily about your birth mom? Was there a desire to know your birth yeah. dad? You know, I think to a certain extent, yes. But not really. I never really have had that desire. Hmm. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I just never have. Um, but I think part of that does play into my story a little bit. Um, because my mom was very young. She was 15 when she had me. So very, very young. And I think there's a question of paternity too. Mm. So I just don't, it would involve a lot more to find who my father is. And I just don't, yeah. Really care, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe there was a little bit more of a desire prior to meeting my biological mother. Mm. But once that habit, I just lost all desire. Yeah. So, okay. I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and it is so interesting how every child is different. I mean, it's, I guess it shouldn't be that interesting. We're all very different people. Um, right. But like, were your brothers, you said you had, was it two brothers? Uh, I have a brother and a sister. A brother and a sister, but they were both adopted. Did they feel some of those same things or did were they different in that way? Very different. Each of us are very unique and have mm-hmm. a very unique story. And it's it's very interesting how our stories each play out completely different and our yeah. desires are completely different. So yeah, yeah it's Mine was very unique with my obsession. One of them has no desire and the other one is kind of indifferent. So it's, yeah. it's very yep. different. Yep. Yeah. I yeah, think that's good unique. to hear. I think that's good to hear because yeah. it's easy to put a blanket statement on it, it. If we really think about it, it makes no sense. But if we're, we're not really thinking about it, it can be easy for us just to say, oh, everyone feels this way. Right. That's just not true. Right. 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 So that's, and that's, I think even even with bi, you know, within biological absolutely. or you yep. know, traditional families, yep, every child is very different. Some are very close with their parents, and some are not. Right. So it's right very unique within every family situation. Yeah. So as you talked about, it kind of became an obsession, and it, that became more 
when you turned into adolescence? Is that kind of when that ramped up? Yeah, I would say so. And I think it was just as that conflict with my parents um, grew, I was a very independent person. And then my personality is very different from my parents. Mm -hmm. I am very uniquely different from them. And so I think that did create maybe some extra conflict. Mm -hmm. But it that's okay. You know, now I look back and that's okay. I am unapologetically me. Mm -hmm. And I think playing out and seeing how my life has played out now, even some of the comments that I've made, I look back at my mom and I'm like, you said this to me. Like I, if, if I had followed that path, I could never have accomplished this, you hmm. know? And so I think seeing where I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but seeing where my life has gone, like I'm very thankful hmm. that I am so uniquely different from that. Hmm. But at the time it was so soul crushing mm -hmm. to be different right. and to be so unique because they didn't understand me. And that just felt like the end of the world mm -hmm. at the time right? because I hadn't found my voice and developed mm -hmm. and discovered who I was and developed into who I was. Yeah, absolutely. So it was very difficult. That makes a ton, like a ton of, ex or it makes a ton of sense. Um, you've written this and you've kind of spoken already to it, but I'm just going to see if you have more to add. Um, you said, as I approached adolescence, I placed so much blame for the internal struggles I was having on my adoption. I felt so strongly that because I was not biologically related to my parents, they could not possibly understand me. Um, which is very much what you've been saying, but is there anything more to add kind of to that just to help us understand what a child might be feeling um, in a similar situation as you? Yeah, I mean, I think, part, I mean, to a certain extent that, yeah, that is kind of self-explanatory, but also I think just, and not just adopted kids, but any kids, just because your parents don't understand you doesn't mean it's, because of biology or because mm. of, you know, it, it can just be you're finding your voice and you're, as you're growing and going through adolescence, you don't even know who you are yet. Mm. You're still discovering who God is growing you and developing you into that unique person. And mm -hmm. so you don't even know who you are yet. You think you do. Right, <laughs> and you're right. discovering who that is. Mm -hmm. But and some of those unique traits are coming out, but you don't, it's not refined yet. And it never is fully refined, right? We're sure. always growing and right. developing into right. who we are. Um, but I think just because our parents don't understand us doesn't mean that they don't care about us or that they don't love mm. us or that there's something wrong with the relationship. And I think mm. that was the biggest thing is I was looking for something wrong with the relationship and I had an easy thing to pinpoint it at. Mm. So I found that and it created a huge wedge because I had something easy to blame it on. Mm. So. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it makes a yeah, ton just, of sense. Yeah. I, I think as you say that, like, that isn't that the beauty of people and the uniqueness. Like there are things uh, we have different people here in the office and um, we're all very different and we have some similarities and we have shared the same heart, but there's things the way I come at a pros project is so very different than the way somebody else does or the way I come at when I, <laughs> when I eat my lunch, I'm like, mmm, that's so good. You know, like I, I just love the food, you know, and one of my coworkers, she just laughs. Cause she's like, I just love how, I love how you love to eat, <laughs> you know, the way, <laughs> you know, it's just funny because, and I think that if we can appreciate the uniquenesses in each other and it's okay that we don't completely get each other, we're not going to, like, right. and I think, when we have, if we can draw that and point it to God and say, okay, but you do completely get me. You created me. Um, and that is what I need is to know that I'm fully known by you. Um, then I don't need to right. be fully known by people in the same way, in the same way. Right. Right. Exactly. And I wish I had learned that younger. Mm. I wish I had 
really understood that at a younger age. And I wish somebody had, I wish I had met an, I don't think I really even knew any other adoptees mm, at that age. Yeah. I really wasn't in any of those circles. So I, I had never had anybody sit there and tell me their story, or I've never yeah. heard another story. And I think that's why it's so important for me to tell my story because mm. If I had heard even one other person say, hey, it's okay. These feelings are normal. Yes. You're not, it's not wrong to feel this way. It's not abnormal. It's Mm -hmm. okay to have these conflicted feelings. Mm -hmm. It's okay to love your adoptive family, but still want to know where you came from. It's still, it's okay. I think it would have made such a difference in my mm. in those adolescent years. It yes. really would have. Because those feelings, when you haven't seen them mirrored by anybody else, they're very isolating. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And I didn't have anyone I could talk to, which mm. I think is probably why it became an obsession. Because mm-hmm. it was all these internal thoughts. Mm-hmm. And it's just... Just you know, kind of turns in your head and keeps swirling and swirling and it just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And yep. it it's insane. It becomes mm. completely insane. So what it, you did mention earlier that you you were able to finally meet her and you had fantasized about this. You had, I mean, maybe tell us more. What did you expect this meeting to be like? And Maybe I should even back up a little bit. How did you find her? <laughs> Let's go there. So I I don't remember exactly how I found her. I mean, I know even then the internet was not, I think it was 2008 maybe when I found okay. her. So 2008 internet was not what it is yeah, now even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm trying to remember exactly how. Somehow I found her home address. And even then it was, I wasn't completely sure it was her because, so I had a, her senior picture. Hmm. My mom had given me her senior picture and it had whited out her name. Well, white out, you can scratch off pretty easily. (laughs) So I scratched off the white out and I found her name. Well, she had gotten married. So I had to, I was pretty sure it was her, but I wasn't a hundred percent positive. So I found the address and I just sent a letter and was like, hey, yeah. I think I'm your daughter. Not sure. Here's my email address if you want to email me. It could have wow. been anyone. Like, who knows who was going to email me? Huh. Like, it could have been some random creep that emailed me. Who knows? Like, looking back on this, I was insane. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she emailed me and then huh. we lived about six hours apart from each other. So she was, I forget one of her other daughters. She was going to be about three hours away from me. So for something with her other daughter. So we were going to meet up. So that was about halfway. And and how old were you at this point? I was 21 at this point. Okay. Okay. So we were going to meet up. I went by myself three hours away Wow. to meet up with her at a hotel could have been some wow. random, like looking back, it could have been some random creep for all I knew. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness it was her. Um, but yeah, looking back, it was really dumb. But I think I expected this like magical moment. I expected mm. to walk into that hotel lobby and just have this insane connection, see each other across the lobby and just know Mm. instantly that the mother daughter bond and just have that connection and have those missed years Mm. made up in moments. And I, I know that sounds crazy to say, but for some reason I just, you see those videos of the meetings at the airport Mm -hmm. and you know, the, just those magical moments. And I really thought it was going to be that. Mm -hmm. And I got there, it was a rainy night and I got there and I walked into the lobby and I kind of looked around and she was sitting at a table with her back to the door, Hmm. which was odd. (sighs) And I kind of walked up and it was a, hi, (sighs) hi. 
And it was very, very strange. And I really tried to make something of the evening and it was okay. You know, like we talked, we kind of connected, but it was, there was just nothing there. Hmm. And then there was a, another weekend. It was around Thanksgiving time. Um, she invited me to then come and meet her entire extended family. So I met the entire extended family and I sat at the table and they grilled me for hours about mm. all of my religious beliefs, oh, wow. about how I had grown up, whether I was like a good moral person. There was no like, hmm. I think their intentions were good, but there was no like, who are you? Mm. How have you, like, how did you grow up? Who are you as a person? You right. know, there was no, there was no wanting to get to know me or including me in the family. Mm -hmm. It was very much, I just, they set me at the head of the table oh, wow. and gathered around and grilled me mm -hmm. for like an hour. And it was just incredibly awkward. And there was, after that weekend, I think I was just, actually, I think it was only there one night. Um, but after that, it just, there was no connection. There was no connection with anybody. And I, I walked out of there and I remember getting in the car and audibly saying, thank God I was adopted. <laughs> wow. And I think at that moment I knew like it was over and, hmm. and it became, it almost flipped actually. It became where she was obsessed with me and I was no longer obsessed with her. And it ended up being, I had to change my phone number. Wow. Um, because it just became overwhelming the opposite way. And mm. I felt no connection and, and it became like, I owed her things. And mm. I was like, but I don't, and I owe you nothing. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for, you know, giving me to this wonderful family. Mm. But that's it. And so I ended up kind of walking away from the relationship and I'm sure that really hurt her. And I, there mm. are, looking back, I would do things differently. I wish I could go back and apologize yeah. for how I did it. Sure. I was young, I was dumb, but also at the same time, I don't want to open that door again yeah. <laughs> to necessarily, you know, go back and apologize for how I did it. But I think lessons learned all the way around, Absolutely. you know, but yeah. I think it was just such a disappointment and walking away from it going, wow, I spent a lot of time, a lot of wasted time wanting and hoping and dreaming for this thing that didn't exist. It wasn't mm. there. It just didn't exist. And I think that also left me with another gaping hole mm -hmm. of, well, then who am I? Yeah, you know, sure. if I don't, I mean, I'm very thankful I'm adopted. I grew up in a wonderful family and, mm -hmm. but then if I don't fit in this family and I don't fit here, mm -hmm. then where do I fit? Mm -hmm. So I think that that was just a really big struggle for me. So then my new obsession became <laughs> having my own biological children. Real fun. <laughs> So that was my other new obsession, <laughs> which is a whole other thing that, <laughs> so, which I don't know if you, well, yeah, I, I want to go into this, um, but I do want to ask, uh, after you left her at the hotel that first night, did you just kind of feel numb? Did you just feel like, did you feel mad? Did you feel sad? Like, what were you? Cause it was kind of this whole thing that you'd built up, like you said, and then it felt very anticlimactic. Right. Um, what did, do you remember I that drive home? I think I was still like, had this false excitement. I see. Like maybe, like, like maybe it just wasn't there yet. Got it. Maybe yeah. we just need more time to get to know each other. Maybe, you know, it was still mm -hmm. like that. I just think there was still a false hope that it could still happen. Um, 
that maybe there, you know, it wasn't yet, but it could still happen. And I made a lot of excuses mm -hmm. um, because that was kind of the time that I first realized that, you know, there was some mental illness. There was a, there was some physical um, disabilities as well. So at that time, I was kind of like, okay, m maybe, maybe we just need to work through some of that. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, maybe, but also... No, like <laughs> now I, and, and I say that because I've learned, and again, this is like, I've come full circle with this mm. because the biological mother of two of my children has some of this, has some similar things to my biological mother. And I'm mm. very close with her and mm. she, we've kind of adopted her into our family as well. And she loves her children and she's, engaged with her children and mm. I see that in her and I'm like no you know now looking back and I can mm. compare the two and it's no there was definitely something missing I, there yeah. and you know there definitely was because mm -hmm. I, I can compare the two and there was something missing yeah so yeah that's a whole lot and that's process. okay yeah, absolutely. Like now so, I'm okay with it. <laughs> it takes time it takes yeah there's well, I don't want to speak like I know what it takes <laughs> because I haven't experienced yeah. that. Um, I So were you married at this point at 21? No, I didn't get married until was I 28, 29. Okay. 28. I was 28 when we got married. Okay. So you did um, have an experience with trying to have your own biological children as well, right? Yes. Which didn't really go the way you hoped. No, it didn't. So we definitely tried. And then um, we started down the path of doing some fertility treatments. And I just did not react well to the side effects. Mm. And because I'm adopted to, I think it was an easier decision because I'm adopted and it's kind of so normal for me. Mm -hmm. I just was kind of like, eh, let's just <laughs> adopt. Forget this. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. Let's just adopt. So we started looking into adoption and I had a friend who earlier in before I was married, um, who had done foster care and I had done respite for her, helped her out with her foster kids. So I had been introduced to the foster care world a little mm -hmm. bit more. So I kind of presented it to my husband, like, what if we did it this way? He right away was, no, uh. <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, no. So I kind of just kept bringing it up <laughs> over the next couple of years. And finally, I remember it was an Easter Sunday. We were sitting out in his, out in the garage. And I said, we're doing it now or we're not doing it at all mm. because we're not getting any younger. So Let's sit down. What are your fears? Mm -hmm. Let's actually hash this out because you keep saying no, but why? Mm. So we actually hashed it out. And finally, he was like, you know what? My nose are stupid. Let's do this. Ah. So we did. And us two little naive, <laughs> we <laughs> thought we were just going to you know, save the world and be sweet little foster parents <laughs> jumped right in. And wow, that was an experience. <laughs> we dove right in, um, but wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, but we are, so we actually, we thought we would go through, you know, many placements before we ever adopted any of our kids, but we ended up adopting our first two placements. Okay. So we went from zero to three kids within five months wow. and adopted our first two about a year and a half in. And then our second two, it took five years for their case to wow. finally close. And they just closed actually two weeks ago. So wow. We, yeah. <laughs> so we're taking a little time of recovery after that. Yeah, absolutely. But, wow. Yeah. So uh, very cool. Uh, it's, you know, what I love about the Lord is that he, you know, if when we're holding on to our lives like this, like fist tight, I want to control it. 
it just, one, it's just not realistic. We can't control, right? There's right. too many things outside of our control. But I just know that in my life, when I try to live like this, I'm, I'm more tense. I'm, I get more perfectionistic. I get a little crazy, you know, like I get real controlling of my kids and it doesn't go well for anybody. And so I just continually right. try to like release, like, Lord, just, I surrender. I trust you more than I trust me. Help me to live. And he does, when, when we live like that, I think we see all these changes and the things that are not expectations that were not met. Like you can talk through many in your life. You had expectations that were not met, but now you can share with us that those are, there's gift in that. There's grace in that. There's joy in that. Um, because right. there's a, there's one who is in control and who is good. Right. And I think a lot of my healing came as I was, it's so easy to, you know, when you're, fostering these children and looking at others, right? And mm -hmm. others who are in pain. It's so easy to say all the right things to them. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to believe it for our own lives. Mm -hmm. And so many times I was sitting there and going, oh, they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, so am I, mm -hmm. right? So am I. They are perfect. God has a perfect plan for their life. He does for me too. Mm -hmm. He's going to use their pain for beautiful things. Same for my life. He's mm -hmm. going to do the same for my life. And I almost had to sit there and talk to myself the same way I was talking through their lives. Because mm -hmm. my first two are older. So they were quite a bit older and experienced a ton mm -hmm. of trauma before they came to us. And very, very painful experience and of course brand new brand new parents brand new foster parents like whoo that was that was a lot to go through but I learned so much through that and I learned so much about my own healing too and how watching God heal them almost gave and this sounds strange, but almost gave myself permission to mm. allow, stop and allow God to heal me too. Wow. Cause I think I almost live in this, well, somebody else has it worse. And yeah, mm -hmm. they do. Somebody mm -hmm. always has it worse, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't care about me too. Yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't care about my hurts and my struggles. So he still cared. He took away everything that I ever wanted. I wanted mm. that biological connection. He took that away in every single way, shape, and form. Wow. Every single way. And like now it's funny. Like we joke about it in our house mm. that my husband's the only one that has a biological family. Like, well, everybody has a biological yeah. family too. But yeah, well, we joke it. now. Like, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Like he's the oddball now. <laughs> but <laughs> it's so it's but he, God took away every single mm. thing that I really wanted. I didn't end up with that connection. I found my mom didn't have that connection. Mm. Even my biological sisters, the one I thought maybe I'd kind of have a connection with, ended up didn't. You know, it's mm. all these different connections. Couldn't have my own biological children. Couldn't all these connections that I wanted so desperately, he took away mm. and then gave me. I always swore I would never adopt, <laughs> never would adopt. And then that was, ended up being the easiest decision because I was familiar with it. Mm. And because I did know that it was a good thing and that wonderful mm. families could come from it. It ended up being a really easy decision. So it ended up being the one thing I didn't want was the thing that God used to mm. completely heal me. Wow. Which is so, that's so that's, incredible. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. That's big. And yeah. Yeah. And, and talk to us about how you were able to kind of reconcile who you are through all of this, because that was such a, a question for you. Where do I fit? Who am I? Uh, 
how have you reconciled that piece, your identity piece? I think, you know, I think one of the things, like I grew up in a very, very conservative home and I've always been kind of a loud mouth and kind of very opinionated and very, um, maybe not the sweetest person here. Um, but I think, so that was a huge struggle. You know, I wasn't the sweet, um, compliant. I was not necessarily rebellious, but I wasn't always the rule follower. I pushed things, I questioned things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a lot of the conflict with my parents was, well, Mm -hmm. they don't understand me. They don't. And now looking back, I can see I was, that's who I am because I could never have been a foster parent and fought Mm -hmm. the things I've had to fight and had to argue against. I mean, I've had to go up against some pretty um, aggressive people to fight for Mm. what is right for these kids. And Mm. it doesn't mean I'm all my voice is always heard, but sometimes you got to be the squeaky wheel to eventually get heard. Mm. And sometimes you, I mean, you can't always be sweet and you can't always be, I mean, always be, I always say always be kind, but you can't always be (laughs) sweet and quiet. And so, so I think fine, you know, going, looking back, I told my mom, like, if I had been that sweet, quiet person that you always wanted me to be, I could never have done what I've done. And I could never be where I am today. I would end up in a pile on the floor every single day in mm. tears, which there are quite a few days that that has happened. But <laughs> it would probably have happened more. Um, so I think it's, you know, finding my place and finding the, those hurts and those pain, that pain and even just the disappointment in parents. Like, while I can't, feel the same things and the same disappointment in parents that maybe my kids feel in their biological parents. I can, to a certain extent, Mm -hmm. feel a disappointment and understand like, yeah, it really stinks when you can't have the communication that you want and that Mm -hmm. you desire with them. Mm -hmm. And so we can bond over that and we can be disappointed in that together Mm. and we can share that we can have that open communication and talk through that. Mm. So I think finding my place is kind of, and it's really been kind of a recent realization that Mm. this is finding my place, finding who I am. All of that has led up to being the mom for these kids because of what they have had to go through, what I have had to go through has led me here. Mm. There's purpose. Here you, you found yeah. purpose, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you mentioned, so I want to ask you, talking with your kids about some of those disappointments, what are your thoughts on how to help our kids when they have, specifically when they have birth parents who have made continued poor decisions or hurtful decisions when their parents are not a safe person for them to be with, you know, like that sort of situation when there is a boundary that's needed. What have you found in how you honor them as people and yet help your kids not to kind of see them idealistically in the way that you were seen or is it like, what is, how do you process with your kids? It's tough. It's really tough because I never want to bad mouth their parents. Right. You know, that's the last thing you want to do because then you become the bad guy and, mm-hmm. and you don't ever want to disrespect their parents because ultimately they are their parents. Absolutely. So I think it, that's a very, it's a very fine line, but also you want to be honest and truthful with them, obviously age appropriately. Um, right. You want to be honest and truthful with them. So, you know, I have things I say to my 15 year old are very, very different than things I say to mm. my five year old who is now starting to ask questions and, yeah. um, you know, notice things. And so I think we, we have very, very different conversations mm-hmm. in, you know, for the five year old, it's, you know, mommy's sick or, you know, mom, 
mommy's not feeling good or, you know, it's things along mm-hmm. those lines. Um, mommy needs some extra help today. Mm. Things along those lines. Um, we'll see her another time mm-hmm. uh, where when that's a very different situation where there can be sometimes, you know, yep. and yep. actually, you know, it's, it's an ebb and flow yep. where there is no contact with the older ones. So that is a much more difficult situation. So yeah. we've dealt with it in different ways. And mm-hmm. I think it, we just open and honest conversations, you know, when they want to talk about the good times, you don't ever make a face. You mm. openly talk about those good times. You, you, share in their joy and their excitement and in those happy memories Mm -hmm. and you encourage those conversations Mm -hmm. and don't ever, you know, never shut those down. Welcome those with open arms, you know, and really sit there and talk about them. We have what's called the birthday box and we, they make cards and write letters for birthdays, Mother's Mm. Day, Father's Day, things like that. And we keep it in a box Mm. and that's their way of honoring. And they just put cards and letters Mm. and things in there. And then maybe someday they'll give them to them. Maybe not, you know, they, and they know that, but it's their way of just remembering and they put the date on there. So they know what year it was written. Mm. Um, So we do that. We do. And then sometimes it's very painful, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's, painful conversations. And then we sit there and sometimes it's 15 year old curled up on your lap, like a small child and Mm -hmm. you're holding them through those painful conversations. And again, you're listening, you're not bashing, you're just listening. And I'm sorry you had to go through that. And I'm so sorry. Mm. No one was there for you. I'm sorry that you weren't Mm. heard or seen, you know, and those it's tough, but and then you go in the bedroom and you tell your husband how hard it is and you yeah. vent then, you know, right. and you vent in an appropriate way. But mm-hmm. or you go to therapy and you vent there. Yeah, right. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. And but you know, you just make sure that you are that safe place for your kids mm-hmm. and open and open to all types of conversations, I think. Yeah. I love that. Wow. Anna, as we close here, um, do you have any final words of encouragement? I think just for all my uh, fellow adoptees or anyone who finds themselves in the same, you know, boat that I'm in where you are not biologically connected to anyone, just really embrace where you're at in life. Be thankful for where you are and the people who you are surrounded with. Don't waste your time like I did searching and looking for the next greatest thing, because sometimes it's right in front of you and right where you're at. Um, Society, I believe, places way too much uh, importance on and value on biology. And so it is ingrained in us that we have to be biologically connected to someone. Hmm. And the truth is, we don't. And I think God puts us each where we are supposed to be. Hmm. And we don't need to constantly be searching for the next greatest thing. I've, uh, you know, as I've experienced, just embracing where I'm at in life has brought me so much more joy and just continue to live in the moment and not continually look for the next greatest thing. Mm. That's a good word. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much. Well, I hope that today's episode encouraged you wherever you are on your foster care journey. We want you to stay connected, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you will never miss an episode. Also, we have great content at theforgotteninitiative.org. Thank you for watching. I cannot wait to be with you next time.